name is Neil Farber. I'm a docent at the San Diego Air and Space Museum and also a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. I'm going to be talking today about Mars myth to magic. So the path of Mars exploration has been uh, millennia long. It started in ancient times with uh, ancient visualization, usually through eyesight, uh, and often Mars was described as a god. In more modern times, from the 1600s through the 1800s, Mars was viewed through a telescope from the Earth. And there was a great deal of misinterpretation that we'll talk about. And then finally, in the modern age, in the space age, there have been many probes that have either flown by Mars, uh, orbited Mars, and landed on Mars. And we'll talk about that. And Mars has turned from initially something of a myth and now into something that is magical. And we'll explain why. So in ancient times in Greece and Rome, uh, this is, Mars was one of the first planets described. Uh, the term planets uh, was Greek for wanderer. And unlike stars, the planets change their location in the sky from day to day. Mars was first originally described by Aboriginal Australians, but was distinctly noted to be a planet by the Greeks and then the Romans. The Greeks and Romans termed the god Ares in Greece or Mars in Rome. And it was interpreted to be a fiery and impetuous personality. This was mostly because of the blood red color as well as multiple changes in brightness that happened throughout the year. And it was thought of as being a pulsating heart and blood. There were many omens that were often attributed to Mars's appearance and motion. The orbit of Mars was first worked out by Johannes Kepler in 1609. Unlike many other of the planets, and especially the Earth, Mars's orbit is very much an oval, so that it's closest to the sun at 206, a little over 206 million miles, and farthest from the sun at about 249 million miles. And this causes an eccentricity in its seasons. The tilt of the axis of Mars is very close to Earth, and that's 23 degrees from the uh, vertical. And that causes a longer, colder winter in the southern hemisphere in Mars, but a shorter but warmer summer in northern hemisphere. And you can see this uh, on this diagram. Earth's orbit around the sun is fairly circular. It's not exactly. It's, it, too, is an oval, but, but more circular than Mars is, which is way out here, um, close in this point pretty far out at this point. The first telescopes uh, were seen by Christian Huggins in 1659, who discovered markings on Mars. Galileo did not mention anything about Mars in his writings. Giovanni Cassini spotted bright areas at the poles and, and believed it was ice, which it turned out to be. And in the 1830s, Wilhelm Bohr and Johann Hemmock von Madler uh, mapped all the light and dark areas on Mars. And you can see that here. Uh, these are the bright areas at the poles that are ice. And then these darker areas in the southern, more southern hemisphere and lighter areas in the northern hemisphere. And this is what led to some of the, the myths about Mars in the late 1800s. John Phillips in the 1860s postulated about these markings and thought that the reddish northern hemisphere was land, whereas the grayish, grayish southern hemisphere was water. Giovanni Schiaparelli saw some new markings that he believed to be canali or, or canals. And this led Percival Lowell in the late 1800s, who was British, to postulate that the blue-green areas, the darker areas, are seas. 
and that the canals were made actually by intelligent beings in order to bring water to the more drier northern hemisphere. Percival actually uh, had drawings like this, where they were these long canals from the south up to the north. And he imagined them to be something like this, where there was uh, atmosphere with clouds and these long canals bringing water to the northern hemisphere. hemisphere. Um, and these that these were artificial and created by these beings of intelligence on Mars. Unfortunately, the idea of canals and, and intelligent life was debunked. Edward Emerson Bernard, who was a California astronomer, advised caution as to other explanations for the canals. And Alfred Wallace, Russell Wallace calculated that the temperature on Mars would be bitterly cold. And in 1909, further observation found that the markings were not actually canals at all. And you could see here that what was thought to be these canals were actually either ridges or canyons on Mars and were naturally formed and not, not of intelligence. We, when we get towards the space age, early Martian flybys finally put the rest to the idea of any intelligent life being present. Mariner 4, which was the United States um, flyby in July of 65, passed within 6,000 miles of Mars. And instruments on board it showed that the atmosphere was less than 1% the pressure of Earth's. And what little atmosphere was there was made up 95% by carbon dioxide. So unable to really support any life, or at least intelligent life. Mariner 6 in 1969, also by the United States, passed within 2,000 miles of Mars and had no Earth-like features, just mainly craters, and that the poles were made up of solid CO2 or, or carbon dioxide, meaning dry ice. And you could see here, um, the flybys showed that Mars was heavily cratered, uh, and you could see these craters here. Uh, this being a very larger crater, along with this one up here. Then in the early 1970s, uh, there were some early Mars orbiters. The USSR, Soviet Union at the time, showed that uh, they had a Mars 2 and Mars 3 orbiters. They were unable to actually visualize the surface due to a large global dust storm on Mars, which does occur from time to time. But they did determine that the temperatures on Mars were very cold. It was minus 166 degrees Fahrenheit at the poles. The rest of Mars was minus 135 degrees um, to plus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the temperature about uh, the Antarctic in the, uh, in the winter. The US uh, had Mariner, Mariner 9 in 1971. And that had some of the best images up to that time of Mars. And it also imaged what we now know to be the biggest sol uh, volcano in the solar system. These are the images that it took, and they, they were fairly good at showing uh, various ridges and canyons along with craters. And you can see how cratered the surface is, similar to the moon. Uh, but also has Olympus Mons, this, which is the biggest volcano in, volcano in the solar system. It's 388 miles across at the base, which is about the size of Arizona, and it's 80,000 feet tall. So this is huge. We don't have anything like that on Earth. And you can see a, a better image of this here. Uh, color image, with this being the entire uh, area of the volcano. This is the actual uh, central area of the volcano, but it, it is huge across. Along with more developments in the space age, uh, man then turned the myth of Mars into the magic of Mars. 
The first things that happened were the vo the Viking orbiters and landers in 1976. And the orbiters findings found Earth-like style of valley networks. And these were believed to be small tributaries that merged into, into rivers, with even, even some river del deltas being seen. This lent credence for the presence of liquid water at some time in Mars's past. The Viking 1 lander uh, was the first spacecraft to actually soft land on Mars, and it showed that it had re highly reactive compounds in the soil. This, again, leading credence to the idea that there may have been liquid water in the past, as well as possibly some organic molecules being present. And I don't know if you can see it, but there are these areas that show uh, what looks like uh, tributaries and end in what looks like a river delta uh, along these areas. Obviously, it was seen from, from the orbit, and it was not sure that this was the case. These could have been made by many other things. Um, and this is the a picture of the actual lander that had uh, landed at that time on Mars. More advanced orbiters, Global Surveyor in, in March of 1999, had high resolution images, and it did find sedimentary layers, meaning something geologic that sediments out in layers. The problem is that it wasn't sure whether this was wind deposits or an impacts from, that is meteorite uh, events causing these layers or multiple volcanic eruptions causing these layers, or water, which was what was hoped for, but we weren't sure yet at that time. And you can see the, these are clearly uh, layers uh, on Mars. Uh, various areas that show these layering all across uh, the orbit of these orbiters. This is a, a more really high really fine view. And this is, clearly shows these layers uh, of uh, geologic substance, but not clear as to what caused it at that point. There were problems with landers though. Most importantly, they were stuck in one location. Also, they were limited in number and complexity of instruments and they had a limited ability to transmit images. Technology of those landers was early, it was in the 1970s, and therefore the speed at which images could be transmitted was very slow. It would take up to 20 minutes to transmit just one photograph um, that they had the uh, lander had taken. M NASA and JPL then got together to uh, produce some rovers that were able to actually roam the surface of Mars, uh, have better instruments, and transmit pictures at a much faster rate. The first of these was Sojourner in July of 1997, and this developed a 3D representation of the surface and also looked at the chemistry of loose dust and soil. It was mostly a technological experience uh, it was small and didn't have a lot of instruments on board, uh, but showed that we could land a, a, something on Mars that would then be able to function on the surface. Then in 2004, there was a twins of spirit in one area of Mars, as well as opportunity in another area of Mars, uh, landing only about a month apart. Um, these were built similarly and looked fairly similar. Spirit was in an area that was a hot, believed to be a hot spring in the past. Opportunity, uh, where it landed, found sedimentary rocks and did find one mineral called jarosite, which is only found in a watery environment. Again, leading more credence to the fact that at least some of the areas on Mars may have been watery in the past. The only problem with them is that the way they landed, the technology they had was this sort of landing bag. Um, 
it was slowed with an aero shell, uh, meaning a, a heat shell to uh, slow it through the reentry period and then a parachute. Um, but then it was just a bag that sort of bumped along on the surface of Mars until it finally stopped and then would deflate. So they knew the general area it was going to be in, but it could be miles and miles from the specific area in which they wanted to land. Um, this is a picture of Sojourner, which was the small uh, uh, rover that first uh, explored Mars and was able to show that a rover could function on Mars. It did get pictures of it was useful in that regard and led, uh, and this is an, a, a close-up picture of it against a rock. Uh, but this led to the spirit and opportunity being on Mars and these were larger, still fairly small, but, but with a better camera, better instruments and better transmission of the images that were taken. These did function with solar cells, and that's one problem that we'll get to in a minute. Um, this is the area of the hot spring that uh, Spirit was located on. And you see some of these white areas that was uh, salts that developed in the area because of it being in a hot spring. And this is the other uh, rover at that time opportunity and you see see its wheels tracks so it, it's roving over some of the surface of mars this is also some of the sedimentary rocks seen up close by opportunity and again the pictures that were taken from orbit now you see from the surface and it does show that it is it has this layering effect so was there water on Mars? Was there more evidence to support it? Because at this point, we have a suspicion of it, but not good enough proof. If present, it might indicate a different ancient Mars, an ancient Mars that was not only wetter, but also warmer, and that presented the possibility of previous life. Life requires three things. It requires persistent liquid water for a time. It requires some, some kind of energy. Uh, in this case, it would be from the sun. And then it requires minerals uh, that, re that is, are necessary for life. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, um, those kinds of atoms uh, that are required to have, uh, to combine in different ways to form life. So the question also was if there is, if there was life on Mars, was it ancient only or was it ongoing? And there were a number of orbiters and landers launched that tried to answer these questions. Uh, Odyssey was a polar orbiter in October of 2001 and through its instruments found significant ground ice. Um, there was ground ice under the Martian surface. They were unsure if this was water or carbon dioxide, but there was ice under there. And it wasn't just at the poles. Um, this is the uh, Odyssey, a picture of it. Um, you can see basically it taking a picture uh, uh, through its radar and showing that, uh, although it wouldn't have looked like this because of the fact that there was ground cover, it showed that underneath that ground cover, there was significant amounts of ice. The R Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter achieved or Mars orbit in 2006, and it showed there were still gullies forming on Mars. Now, they couldn't say whether these were just dry flows of dust or soil, or whether it was something else, but there was dark material flowing down the rocky slopes. And they believe that these were outbursts of actual groundwater, um, not dust or soil, but actual groundwater. And that showed that Mars is still an active planet and not dead yet. Uh, we don't know if there's act actual life there, but we know the planet itself is still quite alive. 
and this showed these gullies uh, where groundwater flows uh, in ancient times, but also probably in the present at times. And this is another picture of these uh, gullies that are forming on Mars. The Phoenix Project landed in the Martian Arctic in May of 2008, and trenches were dug exposing white patches. And again, you know these white patches are ice. You know that they could be either carbon dioxide or water ice. But the Phoenix Project had a spectrometer on board. And this confirmed that these white patches were actually water ice. It showed that there was proof of water ice in subsurface Mars. And this could be the source of these groundwater um, outbursts. It also could mean that um, although ancient life might have existed on Mars, there might be areas where there's actual current life. We don't know that yet. And this is a, an artist's concept of what the Phoenix Project lander looked like. Highly sophisticated, looking at uh, high uh, radar and looking at the, the, the surface below the uh, ground. And these are some of those subsurface white patches that, that were shown uh, where it, it dug into the soil and found uh, this actually being water ice. Um, so NASA was intrigued. They needed more info, information about water uh, and proof that Mars had had a habitable environment at some point in its ancient life. The problems with the small rovers were they didn't have enough instruments. Their solar, solar panels only lasted a year or less. And there was no specific location due to the landing bags. Therefore, larger rovers were designed and built. And they also found, NASA and JPL, found a new way of landing them where they could have a pinpoint landing. And so curiosity and perseverance were built. Uh, curiosity launched in 2010, uh, perseverance in 2021. Uh, they were both as large as a small SUV. Um, so they were hefty things. Each weighed about a ton. There were a large number of instruments and cameras on board. For example, Curiosity had 17 cameras and four spectrometers. And rather than solar cells, these were powered by thermoelectric power generators in order to be able to maintain power for a prolonged period of time. I can tell you that Curiosity landing in 2011 was scheduled to be active on Mars only for about two years. It has now been more than 10 years that it has been active and still functioning. And this was uh, Curiosity, uh, the pristine look when it first landed uh, and the uh, being colored by all of the Martian dust and soil in the last several years. The uh, power source uh, on both Curiosity and Perseverance is a thermoelectric power generator. And you can see this central area consists of a chunk of plutonium. As it decays naturally, it, it gives off heat. So it's not a nuclear reactor but rather just a chunk of plutonium decaying as it normally would. But as it does so, it gives off heat along with particles. And this can be trapped in these fins and used to uh, convert that heat into uh, electricity. And this is what powers the rovers. Um, also, it produces enough heat to keep the uh, entire uh, rover warm overnight uh, on Mars. The landing system for both Curiosity and Perseverance was very complex, consisting of a heat shield, parachutes, 
rockets, and then an actual crane, and we'll get to that in a minute, that allowed for a pinpoint location of the rover rather than just a general area of the rover. And this is a schematic showing how it occurred. The uh, cruise stage uh, from Earth then separates just in the upper reaches of the atmosphere of Mars. As it enters, there's a heat shield on the bottom of the capsule that protects the, the rover, but allows the uh, atmosphere to decelerate the, uh, the container uh, to a large degree. Uh, it then has a parachute that is huge uh, because of Mars's uh, very faint atmosphere. Uh, you need one that's that big, but it slows it further. The heat shield separates. Um, there's a radar lock, and this triggers separation of the uh, container, which has rockets um, that has a so that there's a power descent. And then finally, as it gets close to the surface, and the radar detects that, the uh, the container maintains distance and lowers the rover to the ground via this crane um, as it hovers. And then the container then separates and flies away. And the rover now is active on the surface of Mars. So it's very complex, but allowed for a very pinpoint landing. And both, both landed safely, both were pinpoint in their location. And this is a closer up view of the uh, container, if you will, uh, with the rockets hover, allowing it to hover and the sky crane lowering the rover actually to the ground. Curiosity, as I said, landed where it was intended, designed to last two years, landed in 2012. It's still functioning more than 10, 10 years later. It's now 11 years later. And it's traveled over 17 miles of the surface with many important findings. The surface around the landing site they found was actually made of pebbles. Uh, now, if you look at the moon surface uh, and look at little rocks on the moon, they're all very jagged because of the fact that there is no erosion. Um, the rocks are formed when my micrometeorite strikes um, break larger rocks into smaller rocks. In this case, though, all of the pebbles are, are rounded and smooth, and that's because they're all sedimentary. Many of the rocks and pebbles that are rounded, it's due to erosion due to liquid water. So we know now fairly convincingly that there was liquid water at some point on Mars. And then further away still, there's extensive sedimentary rock being seen. So this uh, water on Mars is not just one isolated area, it's fairly diffuse. They also found that the water, while it did have some salt in it, it was low in its salinity and had a neutral pH. And this means that it probably allowed for life to form. Now we don't know whether it actually did form, but it had the right consistency for it. The other findings was there were spectrometer findings of organic molecules, meaning organic base molecules. Now this could mean two things. They happen naturally, because uh, they do, but usually those kinds of organic uh, molecules that are carbon-based that happen naturally are short chain uh, molecules, things like ethane or uh, uh, methane or those kinds of things, which are only a few carbons in length and fairly simple. The other possibility is that they're biologic in origin, and that means ancient life. And those are more, much more complex molecules. And we can't tell the difference from just a spectrometer. And I'll get to that in a minute. This is Curiosity's landing site. 
it's a picture of curiosity, a, a selfie that was taken. And you can see the general area. And up close, you see that there are these rocks that are conglomerate, meaning um, pebbles cemented together. And that indicates that this was a sedimentary type of rock. And here are those rounded pebbles that we're seeing. Perseverance landed in February of, two, of, of 2021 in Jezero Crater. And this was chosen because it's a river outflow channel in Delta. And this is the best place to look for ancient life. Because what you have is these rivers bringing all of the material from uh, up higher down to this area where it's concentrated. Uh, and uh, this is the area where Perseverance drilled for core samples and stored them in a titanium tube. And we'll show you why in a minute. Perseverance also had attached a helicopter as a trial, uh, the helicopter named Ingenuity. This is the landing site of Perseverance. You see that there's all this sedimentary rock, both near and far. And um, you can see that there's this conglomerate up close, as well as eroded stones in the area. Um, so it's clearly a sedimentary area. And this is a photograph of the helicopter ingenuity. You notice that there are actual two rotors, one above the other, which spin extremely fast because of the low uh, atmospheric pressure on Mars. This was basically a technological attempt at flight on a distant planet. It's the first time there was any kind of flight on a distant planet. Ingenuity was supposed to fly only five times and wasn't supposed to be used for any kind of purpose other than to test that this could have could be achieved. Instead, it has flown over 49 times on the surface of Mars and is actually being used to pick out areas where they want perseverance to travel to. Um, and this is how successful it's been. I did learn the other day that interestingly enough, there's a little piece of the Wright Brothers Flyers wing fabric attached to Ingenuity um, so that basically flight from 1903 for the first time on Earth to flight for the first time on a distant planet. So there's going to be a future mission. Um, Perseverance is collecting these core samples. It's still active and expected to be functioning for another 10 or 20 years. And sometime in the 2030s, so another five to 10 years from now, a return mission is planned. It will land next to Perseverance and it will obtain the samples that have been collected, I'll show you how in a minute, and return them to Earth for study. And the plan is to determine if these organic molecules are biologic and also determine the habitability of Mars. So what will happen is this is the sample return lander. You see this door that's open. Inside is a container that has these slots, uh, which Perseverance will trundle over to and through its arm, put those titanium tubes that it's collected into those slots. Um, that is aboard this, which is the ascent vehicle, which will take off from the surface of Mars, from, from the landing, from the lander, dock with the Earth return vehicle uh, and transfer its container to the Earth return vehicle, uh, which will then deorbit Mars head back to Earth up here, and uh, its container will re-enter Earth's atmosphere. It will land on the surface, be collected, and sent to, the, sent to Houston, 
to the use and return laboratory where those containers will be examined. The plan is to send the material to lots of different sites for examination. The most interesting to me being uh, electron microscopy, which will be able to determine if those molecules are biologic or if they're naturally formed. And by the way, you see that uh, Perseverance had deposited one of those containers on the arm of the sample return lander, which is going to put it into that uh, return vehicle. So what have we learned about Mars? Well, we know that the surface of Mars is extremely arid. Um, it is arid now. We know that water is present in subsurface soil and maybe in lakes. We know that Mars is not dead. There are active changes at the surface in both soil and water outputs. And we know that Mars probably had a habitable environment. When? Sometime between the, the formation of Mars, which would be 4.6 billion years ago, and sometime about a billion years after that, so about 3.6 billion years ago. Now you say to yourself, well, that's a long time ago, and that's not a huge time, because after all, when did Earth have, for, have its formation of life? Well, we believed initially that Earth's life formed probably about a billion years ago and then developed since then. Um, that thought has changed now that we've been exploring more um, about things on Earth. And we know that probably Earth's uh, habitable environment existed and that life probably formed not long after the formation of Earth, maybe within 100 million years of Earth's formation. If that's the case, then we know probably the same thing might have happened on Mars. That is, that within 100 years of its formation, it developed life. And that would have left close to a billion years of time for Earth, for life on Mars, to have developed and evolved. So we know that life might have existed on Mars. We don't know exactly in what kind of way, and we don't know what it looked like, but it might have been there on Mars. The main question, besides finding that out, whether it's really true or not, is, is there still life on Mars? And that hopefully will also be found. So we've come a long way uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, initially, Sojourner, which was just a sort of uh, technological uh, investigation of whether a rover could function on Mars, to Spirit and Opportunity, two rovers that did function and helped us gain more information, to Curiosity and Perseverance, which have gained an enormous amount of information and totally changed our understanding of Mars from the myth that we talked about, the myth that perhaps there, Mars was a god or Mars had intelligent life, to now the magic of Mars having had possibly some kind of life in its past, a totally different environment that we know of than it has now, and perhaps persistent life uh, on Mars now. And from there, we look forward to the time when man will actually walk on Mars and, uh, and or investigate Mars back on Earth and find out the answer to whether there really was life on Mars and whether there still is life on Mars. And with that, I, I will end and leave you to question that in your mind. I'm available if anybody does have questions. You can reach me, my uh, Facebook page or at my uh, email address at neiljfarber at gmail.com. That's N-E-I-L-J-F-A-R-B-E-R -E at gmail.com. Uh, or you can reach me at 
uh, the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Thank you.